My name is Gerald McGuire, and I'm the Professor for Computer Communication at KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. And in this module, I'd like to talk about the situation when communication occurs when others are probably listening. As many of you may be aware, Edward J. Snowden leaked government documents revealing that the NSA and a number of others were actively intercepting and carrying out attacks upon communications of people. So there's no question today that people are listening, whether it's the US NSA, Sweden's FRA, France's DGSE, etc. And in addition, there are private persons and companies who are listening. For example, two sailors on two ships in Sweden were communicating <clears throat> romantic messages back and forth to each other, and they were intercepted in those conversations put up online on a website. But this particular talk was motivated by the fact that I was invited to be a panelist in a panel organized by a KTH academic talk show called KTH Cross Socks. And the title of the show was to be The Dark Side of the Web, The Internet's Parallel Universe. And you can follow the URLs to see various parts of that show. And you can also see a note in the last URL on this page pointing to the fact that, in fact, dark networks aren't necessarily evil. So two years ago, by the time you're listening to this, or perhaps one year ago, in March of 2014, I talked in the same series about securing voice over IP when others are probably listening and focused on eavesdropping and call interception. Today, we're going to focus on location tracking and who's talking to whom. So understanding who the communicating parties are. Well, in the previous talk, we saw that Alice could talk to Bob via an encrypted tunnel. And the result is, if we look here, no matter where the traffic was intercepted on its way, after it had been encrypted, the communications was private. So they could protect their privacy. However, the headers were on the packet, so it was easy to see that Alice was talking to Bob. Even if you implement the scheme used in voice over IP, which is Mikey plus SRTP, where we now separately encrypt each of the media streams, and we even encrypt the real-time transfer protocol control message streams, we still only protect the content, but we don't provide a break in the communicating parties connection between Bob and Alice. Furthermore, we've learned that simply using a tunnel or SRTP encryption isn't sufficient because it turns out that if the codecs change the length of their packets based upon the content, oops, we have a problem because now one can, even though the packets are encrypted by simply observing their lengths and the patterns of spacings between them, we can now reverse engineer what the probable plain text speech was. And Vasily Propoko, in a paper that he wrote for one of my courses on voice over IP, showed that you can defend against it, but it means you have to, in fact, make all of your packets so that they're going to be the same length, and you have to break up the correlation that might have occurred because of the way the encoding was being done. So if we look at the more general pattern of Alice communicating Bob, we see that in the simplest case, Alice communicates directly with Bob using plain text, and of course there's no protection with this. We can see Alice and Bob can communicate by encrypting their text, so now they provide confidentiality, but no anonymity. We know that Alice and Bob are communicating. In 1981, David Chaum suggested that you could use mixers, devices that would receive packets from many inputs, hold them for periods of time, and output them in an order decorrelated from their arrival to try to produce anonymity. And those are called mixes. And so in this case, Alice could send her encrypted text, so she has confidentiality, through this mixes network to Bob, and we could potentially provide anonymity because if we broke up the correlation between the traffic patterns of Alice and Bob. And in the crosstalks panel, I pointed out that Tor, the onion router, provides really only pseudo-anonymity. And it's an attempt to make a child mixer, but it turns out 
that it and many others have some problems because it's known which are the routers being used. So the result is that it's possible to inject traffic. And so you can actually, by modulating the traffic at particular nodes in the middle of the mixer network per tour, you can now label the traffic and by observing that pattern of inter-arrivals at the destination, you can now manage to work your way through the net from Alice to Bob. And there have been quite a number of interesting papers, three by Nicholas Hopper, listed here at the bottom of the slide, which is basically saying, to what extent can we break this relationship of the communicating pattern between Alice and Bob? because of being able to analyze the latency of packets. Well, there's another interesting paper by Kathy Cohen and Katabi called Information Slicing, Anonymity Using Unreliable Overlays. And here they take a very different approach. Instead of assuming that Alice encrypts her traffic, Alice instead codes her traffic and splits it over many disjoint paths. And Alice knows to have the paths converge at Bob, and so only Bob receives all of the different pieces and is able to now take the content, put it back together, decode it, and voila, Alice can communicate with Bob. And we can provide confidentiality and anonymity for Alice. And one of the things that this approach does, which is rather interesting, is that Alice uses another IP address, for example, her IP address at work, and she sends messages to the routers along the way and tells them how to set up their forwarding paths so that the paths will in fact go to Bob. But rather than sending them simply the address information directly, we again use the address slicing approach, and now we take the information and Alice and Alice Prime each send some of the information that the M sub i router needs to set up the forwarding path. So the result is that, of course, yes, we can now break the correlation between Alice when she's sending traffic and Bob when they're actually communicating. However, there are some vulnerabilities for confidentiality. In their paper that they assume a set of things. One, that there was no global attacker. So there was no attacker that could see all of the communication. And the assumption seemed fairly good, that that would be fairly hard to do. However, it turns out that all of Alice's traffic passes through her ISP, and all of Bob's traffic through, passes through his ISP, and there may even be some slice observers that can see all of the traffic on its way from Alice to Bob. So let's look at this first case. Is it a good assumption that there no, is no global observer? Well, it actually turns out that there are only a limited number of backbone providers. And due to the high bandwidth of fiber, in many cases, even separate competing carriers actually send all of their traffic over the same carrier. And as the Snowden documents demonstrate, the result is not surprisingly, NSA and other agencies have tapped into those fibers and they're simply recording all of the traffic going across the fiber. So the result is it may be possible to actually have a global observer. Secondly, they assumed that the ISPs at each end were trusted. However, of course, as again we know, there are actually a limited number of ISPs and in many countries, there's a requirement for lawful interception functions being built into those ISPs so that they can divert the traffic off to some law enforcement agency. So again, this assumption may not be very useful or valid in practice. So we need to think of, hmm, how can we handle this? And of course, the same problem may apply to a slice observer. So one interesting alternative is to think, uh, could we build one of these mixers using something called a software-defined network? And in this case, we're going to use a trusted controller. And the way a software-defined network works is the trusted controller tells each of the switches how to set up its forwarding path given 
the set of parameters that are used to match against the incoming packet. So the result is that Alice now, or in this case, a secure proxy for Alice, communicates with the trusted controller using a secure path. The trusted controller communicates via secure paths. In both of these cases, of course, we can use pairs of keys that they're somehow exchanged in advance. And now Alice's proxy sends the traffic to Bob's proxy, and then Bob's proxy sends it through a secure tunnel to wherever Bob actually is. So now neither Alice nor Bob actually need to know the address of where the other really is at the ends of their tunnels. So we've added some increase in anonymity, but we've had to now trust the controller. Now, one of the neat things that the trusted controller can do to frustrate someone who can intercept the traffic between these switches, the slice observer, for instance, is that they can cryptographically sort all of these paths. So as time passes, they change the paths through this switch network. The result is that the latency-based attacks will not work because, of course, even if I inject traffic against one of these known switches, I don't know that the traffic between Alice asterisk and Bob asterisk is going to continue to use that path. So the result is I don't have a stable value that I can compare the latencies against. And if we combine that perhaps with option one, where we now hopefully can have Alice pass a key to Bob, either using Bob's public key or perhaps providing him with a private key. So we combine this cryptographically sorting of the paths with encryption. Can we now avoid a differential attack, a so-called differential timing attack against this SDN? So does it make a successful mixer or mixes? The next question comes, can we manage to actually do this with a set of untrusted controllers? So one of the interesting things that Chalm's original paper discussed was the fact that nodes participating in it didn't all have to be trusted. So can we compose a set of untrusted controllers where even if one controller does no mixing whatsoever, that the set of them will be sufficient to actually provide anonymity between Alice Star and Bob Star. So to summarize, we see that there are some interesting problems in communications and privacy. We've seen there are ways of providing the confidentiality of the content by encryption, and some ways of hiding the sender's location and identity. Of course, we need to know something about the destination, otherwise we have no way of sending them the traffic, unless they can observe something and know what to observe. So what additional techniques are needed to support traffic and traffic pattern hiding? And what other paths does Alice have that she can communicate with that don't pass through a single ISP? For instance, can she use multiple ISPs to avoid the problems with assumption number two? For example, if her cellular telephone operator is different from her fixed network ISP, she might use that other path. But are those really truly independent? So in the end, it comes down to a question of whom do you trust and why do you trust them? I hope that you'll find this material was interesting and will provoke you to go and look at some of the papers and start to ask some of these questions yourself.